So welcome back to part two in our segment of Shoot Your Questions with Jason Zach. We've had a lot of questions on, you know, how to get gigs, how to buy a keyboard, how to produce uh, some tech challenges, some apps people have asked, and some general practice questions. So it was it was a lot of fun going through this. I'm now going to tackle a few more. So let's get cracking. Right, so we have a couple of nice theory questions also. So let's get started with them. Shan Belchada asks, what is reharmonization and how to use it? Well, reharmonization is when you have an existing chord progression or an existing set of chords and you want to give spice to a few of them or one of them or two of them or you would like to consider changing maybe a few of them or maybe could perhaps all of them. So how you could use it is first of all, if the melody is already written out, you don't want to just choose any which chord which you think is fancy or you know interesting or flurry you want that to go with your melody so if you're reharmonizing a song which has a existing set of notes the chord should still go with those notes so you need to study the rules of reharmonization i've done a detailed segment of what is reharmonization and we've actually reharmonized a, a famous song hallelujah and a few more songs so do check out our reharmonization series we've done quite a few lessons uh, so you would generally use it if you want to add your own spice or your own flavor to the song and also you would use it if you are the composer and you want different options for your own chords. So one simple uh, harmonization concept which I could give you for lack of time in this video could be if you have, if you're harmonizing a note, let's say G and if the current chord at that point was G major you ask yourself, which are all the other chords which might have G in them and would they work with my song? First of all, you could have a C major. You could have a C minor. You could have an E minor. You could have an E flat major. You could have an E diminished. You could have a G minor. You could have a B flat major sixth. You could have a B flat minor sixth. You could have a a flat major seventh F sharp with the G doesn't work but F seems to be nice that's a nice F major ninth out there you can even do something spicy you can take an E seventh and add that G making it a very Jimi Hendrix kind of sound you know so in, in a nutshell there's a lot you can do when you harmonize just one note the G so follow it up with some of our YouTube lessons we leave them up in the description thanks for your question compass north south us what do chord extensions do what do they do with the sound of the chord like for example a major ninth or minor 11th or majors 11th 5 6 that would be really awesome thank you thank you for your question so Chord extensions, I think, by default will just make an existing foundational chord, like a triad or maybe a seventh chord, more colorful. So, for example, if I'm doing a song, Twinkle, twinkle, little star. I'm playing it currently with triads, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. But with an extension, Twinkle, or twinkle twinkle that's a C six nine or that's a C major nine twinkle twinkle little star but some of them won't work star because they go out of scale ah, how I wonder what you are ninth in there so they kind of take maybe the same chords which you are playing but they will make it a lot more spicy so you should think whether you want to substitute chords or reharmonize chords or whether you want to just embellish the same chord you know so both options or both schools of thought exist you can embellish a major chord with a major sixth you can embellish it with a major seven then add a nine to it add 11 to it or add a sharp 11 or a 13 uh, 
But be a bit careful because some chords you may have to commit to the seventh. It could be a dominant chord. So then the seven has to be seven flat. Then that extension is covered. Almost all extensions are a lot more free when you use them with a dominant seventh chord rather than a major seventh or a minor seventh. So you'll find that you have a lot more freedom when the, the seventh interval is a minor rather than major. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. We've done a few tutorials on chord extensions. Check them out. We'll leave you a lesson in the description. So we have a couple more interesting questions which couldn't fit into too many departments of general piano and music theory. So I thought we'll save them or save the best for last, so to speak. First of all, Nivedita Vasant asks, what do you think about AI in music industry? Is it AL or AI? I'm not too sure. I'm guessing she meant AI. So AI is what they call as artificial intelligence, which now has become very popular with all these apps like ChatGPT and whatnot. However, ever since a recording software ever happened from the time of a DAW, I think the artificial intelligence has been there. You know, you have the AI... First of all, we used to fix beats. We used to stop or trim silence. Even movie audio makers, guys who do post-production would rely on this artificial intelligence a lot to save time to fix mistakes. So after the DAW came into play, over time, people got a bit more advanced. They wanted to kind of make beats. They wanted to create loops. So I remember there was this software Reason. Reason and Pro Tools. There were two softwares which I used to use back in the day. Uh, now I don't. Pro Tools basically was an amazing post-production and live musicians, you know, studio recording tool because it could fix a lot of problems and allow you to do some processing of thousand regions, you know, just by clicking a button. So for me, that felt AI. But as things went forward, I think in the late 90s and early 2000s, the the advent of vocal tuning, time correction, pitch correction, that also tended to follow an algorithm. You just hit, open up your auto tune and immediately your vocalist sounds, you know, uh, well, in, in not so correct. They, I would say they sound artificial. So auto tune used to be used as a fun effect. Over this era or the last decade and a half or so people have been using it to correct vocals or to allow a rather inferior vocal to be part of the music industry and showcase their skills because you're making them sound on pitch but the challenge with some of these tools is it loses the soul or it loses the human nature of the performance and human beings who are even at the top of their game, when we sing, when we play a violin, when we blow a horn, we are always going to be slightly off tune with respect to what's considered perfect, which is that A equals 440 hertz. So there's always a debate there. So whenever I think about these things and whenever I have been thinking about them, pitch, time correction, I've always sort of told myself can it save me time? Does this feature or does this shortcut or does this algorithm, does this processor, does this plugin, does this virtual instrument save me time? And if in the, in the process of saving me time, does it not kill my creativity? Because I want to be in control over the song. It's my music or it's my production or it's my mix. So I don't want that external source to kind of take over. So it's sort of like the uh, movement from a regular typewriter to the kind of keyboards we have today, which have Bluetooth, which have backup, which have all of this other these other features, which a computer gives, the computer keyboard. There's nothing wrong with the typewriter or there was nothing wrong at the time, but it just evolved. So I would think... The, the mind of the writer or the storyteller is still the same mind. It's just the ease of getting the words out there which became a lot more efficient and more and more efficient now with new technology for text. But then you don't want that to kind of save you. You don't want that to become you or, you know, take over your own thought process. So with music, there are a lot of useful tools. A few apps which I use for for working with music which i'd like to point out since uh, i also am happy with some ai tools i use 
um, an intelligent dynamics processor called Smooth Operator by Baby Audio. That has saved me a lot of time to fix these annoying glitches which you can make out only on certain listening environments. So few things like that where it dynamically fixes those problems. Uh, there, I use a mastering AI processor called Lander. You can check that out. They have a very good uh, subscription where it kind of gain stages your track pretty well. And for all of you musicians out there, you should definitely consider getting uh, acquainted with Moises. Moises is an incredible AI tool for breaking up or dividing your song. You give it a song and it just breaks it down into all the tracks. So it's great for learning. I can remove the vocals from a song. How cool is that? I mean, I'm a piano player. That vocalist is so loud in the mix. I want to remove him or her. I want to practice my piano. Moises comes into play. Remove the vocal. Just do a piano and a drum thing. And he, there's something even cool. You can release a song with that. You know, it, 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 it may not be royalty free, but you can use it. You can put it up on your social media. There's a metronome feature, which is also AI. It kind of does it, uh, its thing on its own. So yeah, some of my uh, lyric writing friends have also told me that you use AI for lyrics. Now, again, they've always used it as a jump start, not to actually, you, some, so I tried feeding um, lyrics into chat GPT, uh, uh, you know, to write me a blues song about zombies falling in love in Lal Bagh. And it actually did that. And uh, however, I had to be very specific. And as it turned out, it kind of gets those things right because it knows blues. So in, if, you're, if you want options, if you're looking for a sentence or two, great. But as it turned out, it's always good for you to start and then see how this tool can help. And again, I stress on the point, save you the time, not necessarily make you more creative. If an AI can make you more creative, well and good. I, I've yet to find a music AI app which makes me more creative. I would think they make me a lot more focused, but the creativity comes from you. And it's the same with any form of artificial intelligence in any field. It's always there to make things more accurate, more important, more efficient, and uh, not kill the patient in, in terms of the medical field, as you all know. So AI is everywhere. So if it can work in medicine, if it can work in more serious fields, I think we as musicians should just chill out a bit. Our field is very simple compared to all of the other stuff out there. Right, so we have an interesting music production question from Joe Luz, or Joyce Luz perhaps, which is, is better to take my time to produce with a timer like every 30 minutes? I take a pause or to produce the fastest possible or avoid ear fatigue and lack of creativity? It's a very, very good question. And you've kind of said the answer yourself in the question. Yes, a timer is very crucial. So what I have with me is a timer and in a lot of cases, a decibel meter. So it measures how much of fatigue I'm giving my ear and also the timer you can set up a basic timer like this it, it kind of make beeps once it's over it's a rather loud beep it's a bit scary but anyway so what that will do is it just tells you okay leave the room go out go to the garden do something walk your dog you know get a, get a drink of water stand up which is very important you know so another thing i do because sometimes we lack time i have a desk which is sit stand so i'll sit for 30 minutes and i'll stand for 30 minutes i try to do that i don't achieve it all the time but that was the intention of setting it up like that because for our health sitting in an ac room I don't think is very healthy, to be honest. So you need to definitely figure out a way to leave your room, come back. But I just like to add one more small thing to your question. When you're mixing, mastering, recording or doing any kind of work for production, audio is going to keep coming to your ears. Uh, you, for, for the purpose of creativity and for the purpose of protecting your ears and mind and mental and physical fatigue doing all of this work do whatever you do do everything with a lot of aggression and a lot of intensity because every time you process music in a lukewarm way your results are also going to tend to be lukewarm 
So I'd like to put in more than 100% effort and then if it doesn't sound good or if you're not able to crack the problem, take your breaks. But but don't don't just beat around the bush, you know, so to speak. I don't like listening to things more and more and brooding and mulling over problems. I like to look at production, anything I do in a binary way, does it work or does it not work? You know, it's a more old school way of thinking like the tape tape recording era. Musicians had to be damn good back in the day because anytime they missed a take or failed a take, well, they lose that much of that tape. You have to throw that in the bin, right? You've lost a take, meaning you've lost the the tape. It's going to be thrown out and they have to uh, connect a new one into the recording uh, medium, right? So but I would just say work with a lot of intensity and yes, for sure, use a clock. A clock is definitely useful and uh, protect your ear fatigue with a de decibel meter. Also listen to your music from different volume levels for different perspectives. Listen to it very soft. Also don't be afraid of listening to it loud. Not It's not going to be too loud to deafen you. Listen to it loud as well as soft. Have a combination and keep toggling. Also try different listening environments like headphone, then speaker, then iPhone, and whatnot. Thanks for your question. Right, so the last question from Theo8690. I'm seeking guidance on how to increase my visibility and attract opportunities as a pianist. Although I possess the necessary skills, I like the exposure needed to secure gigs. How do you suggest I proceed to connect with potential venues and individuals seeking piano services, whether jazz or classical? Great. Nice question. So... <clears throat> I would first ask, you would first need to project yourself as either an accompanist or as a solo pianist or maybe both. And once you decide on that, you then need to figure out what to do with venues. But in this day and age, what I have learned through our YouTube channel, come to think of it, is what you do in a video is all that you need. In, to, to book a show or to get hired or for a venue to notice you. So from my experience, if you have a full music video of a song, it doesn't have to be a very fancy video. You, yes, you could make it artistic if you have the, the mindset or the skill for that. But if you don't, you could just book a jam room or even in your bedroom environment or hall or just a neat looking space, you could perform as a group if you have a band or alone just to showcase your skills and put your work out there for people to see and document this either in a PDF or in a spreadsheet format and send that out to your local venues and just write them a note saying, I'm a musician, this is what I do. Check out my profile and would you like to collaborate? Do not send, at least in my country, India, please do not send your accomplishments, Trinity, grade, whatever, and uh, whatever else, you know, it doesn't work. If you're trying to get movie work, if you're trying to gig with a band, now those guys would not have done the, uh, let's say, the Royal Board certification. So there'll be an inferiority complex. They won't even hire you because they think you're a big shot already. So you need not talk about yourself. Let your work decide for itself. If you play the piano, you don't need to talk much about it. Just play and show people what you're about. But connect with as many people in the most professional way possible in 2024. That needs a PDF with all your uh, accomplishments, all your collaborations, and a couple of good quality videos. Ideally, YouTube videos and not Instagram videos. The YouTube videos tend to attract venues a bit more, in my opinion. What venues are looking for is the number of fans or followers you have on your IG page. So there you may want to do some reels and these short clips which people piece together from multiple performances and whatnot. But I I still think you can get more long-term gigs. You, you may not even uh, think about performing, but then someone would watch your YouTube video and just give you a call because... If people respect that long form YouTube content, I think a lot more uh, than, yes, Instagram will also work, but have a good combination of both. If you're doing Insta, don't forget YouTube. That's pretty much what I want to say. Have both going on as you journey forward. So 
that's pretty much how you get gigs that's how i do it i just put out videos out there of me performing as you know i compose these regular riffs which happen so um people watch those and we don't have to talk much about ourselves we just let the music decide for itself earlier soundcloud links and you know reverb nation there used to be all these other platforms which i think still exist but i think in today's day and age you need to focus on actual video content professionally short content so people can actually see the person and it's also a better way to trust you as a player if you send people audio clips they'll think oh how did he do this did he use a ai some ai intelligence to make a song or some did he quantize it or something when you do a video it's a lot more legitimate it is what you get if there are mistakes it's there for everyone to see so in a nutshell yeah that's how you get gigs in this day and age uh, another thing i'd like to point out before i forget is back in the day i don't do this as much as i should because of my schedule a lot of my bandmates today do this and uh i applaud them it's very important you have to watch shows you have to go and watch your own neighborhood local talents perform if you want to eventually perform because you can't just sit in your bedroom and expect shows you have to go out there uh, book yourself tickets into a few festivals go to a pub or a restaurant or a local cafe watch a few bands and it's a always a give and take kind of thing you support people and they will in turn support you so the best selling point for you as a musician would be you go to a gig you ask the band hey can i come for your sound check i'd like to hang out or whatever they might give you some odd jobs if you're a junior musician you can connect a few cables you can also hang out with the sound engineer which is what i like to do and then during the show you're going to hang around with them you're going to sit with them and then the next show you can always you know send them some of your work and say can i also jam uh, i think i can do but i could be the keyboardist of your band if they don't have a keyboard so i have kind of done that for a few bands and it's been very easy to get hired by them it's almost a no brainer or it becomes very yes or no they will say yes i will hire you or no you don't work so that's what i like about being hired in a in an ensemble or a band i like them to really want to hire you rather than oh let's try this guy for some time you know by that time i've already known them as people i work to them they know about me i know about them so i don't like to beat around the bush because when you work with a band you want to do it for a long term i look at a band as a friendship so you don't want it to just be a one off thing you know and for for even logistical reasons because if you do a uh, <clears throat> i i may sound a bit selfish but if you do a a uh, a a tribute gig let's say let's say you do a tribute to the beatles or coldplay or whatever you're doing one show in a local pub and they get 500 600 people to come for the concert and and it's an absolute success but then is there an opportunity to put all that hard work into more rewards by taking or copy pasting that concert to multiple locations across the country does your band think big time or long term so i like to work with those sort of bands because then all the work you put in can lead into future uh, opportunities otherwise it's just that one off gig so these days i don't like one off gigs to be completely honest so these are some things to keep in mind uh, for your future as an artist all the best uh, with that and thanks for your question theo So on that note we finished our first segment of shoot your questions with Jason Zack. Thanks a ton for all of your questions and do stay tuned you want to subscribe to our channel without fail because we will put these regular posts and we have additional perks for Patreon members where you can discuss your doubts and come on a video call with me in person and get these things sorted out. So do consider our Patreon page as well for additional perks. Thanks a ton for for watching this video hope you found the answers useful and all the best cheers